today, uh, I'm going to talk about generative AI in the fintech space. And instead of sort of a conceptual discussion on uh, Gen AI, I thought I'd get to some case studies. Let's look at some specific uses of generative AI in BFSI sector, banking and financial services. Some of the use cases might be interesting for fintechs, which are trying to create products. And then um, we can have a Q&A or a discussion around it. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK, as soon as I get my deck up and running, we can get started. How many of you are trying to use Gen AI in your company? Can you raise your hands? That's quite a few. OK. How many of you are based in Bangalore? Maybe half of you. How many of you are techies? Oh, quite a few. Is there anything specific you guys want to talk about in generative AI today? How many of you are using RAG techniques, retrieval augmented generation? One. Anybody using fine tuning? You're using that too. Interesting. What do you do? Authentication platform using AI. Okay. Guys, do I have my deck up and the clicker? Can we connect it? I'm running out of questions to ask. And time as well. And by the way, my session was supposed to start at 4.30, so I've been sitting here patiently. I wish they had set it up while I was waiting for the last one hour. That would have been useful instead of the chit-chat we're having right now. How many of you guys have uh, tried using uh, Claude, Claude 3? But it actually just came out two, two three days ago, I suppose. Uh, I have a couple of slides on Claude 3 that just came out. Apparently the Mixtral latest uh, drop, which got leaked, is supposed to be better than GPT-4. That's interesting too. Can't we just connect it right here? Do you have a HDMI? I waited here for an hour, guys. You could have done all this up front. I have to go there, present from there. Okay. statistical model that basically models a probability distribution over a sequence of words, which means if you gave it something like, I live in Karnataka, I can really speak dash well, everybody knows the answer is Kannada, right? And so on. So the attention paper in 2017 was a milestone paper, after which, of course, the big milestone was December 2022, GPT 3.5 which showed up as a front-end chat GPT. And then many, many other models came up really quickly after that, within a, within a year. Next slide, please. So the growth has been explosive. As you can see, between Google Bard to Anthropic to OpenAI to Microsoft and so on, Stability AI, within a matter of, like, you know, a fairly short time, we have come up with a whole bunch of models that are 
quite intelligent, right? Next slide. So intelligent. Okay, but why is this different? Let's spend a couple of minutes. You know, human beings have always thought that we have been very special. No other animal can do language. Language is incredibly complex. And if you read Yuval Noah Harari's book, The Sapiens, he talks about the neocortex. Our new brain is the one that is capable of language. It's capable of stories. It's capable of mythology and so on, which other animals can't do. So we've always felt very special about it. We are the center of the universe, we are the smartest, we can do all these amazing things and so on. Until now a machine is able to do that. So in some sense this was huge. That's why we were all taken up, uh, you know, taken in by the idea of chat GPT because suddenly it's sort of understanding what we are saying. It's able to do things that only humans used to do. So it's a very big thing from a human evolutionary standpoint, right? So it can do something that no other animal did. Only humans did, and now a machine is able to do language, right? Next slide. The speed of adoption has been crazy. The Renaissance back in Europe took like 200 to 300 years before the idea sort of diffused across Europe. Industrial Revolution took another 200 years for all those ideas of steam engines and spinning jennies and whatnot to slowly spread around the world. The internet itself took like 70 years. If you go back to uh, you know the National Science Foundation funding ideas of networks and so on, Gen AI, few months, okay, a well, few years. If you go all the way back to the 2017 paper and Bert and others before that, maybe six, seven years, maybe 10 years, very fast adoption. Chat GPT, two months, I think. Next slide. I think in two months it hit something like 100 million users, 60 million daily site visits every, every day, daily. So it's crazy what's happening with respect to generative AI. And we can see why, because it brought new sort of capability that we had never seen, right? Next slide. So if you look at the cognitive revolution that took place, the lower left, you know, the x-axis is repetitive tasks, you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again all day, versus non-repetitive tasks, okay? On the y-axis, you have manual work, uh, work versus cognitive work. You know, you work with your hands, you chop wood, you build houses, you, those are all manual labor. Whereas cognitive, you sit next to the computer and do your work, okay? You're coding. You are doing accounting. Those are all a lot more cognitive. That's the y-axis. So if you look at it, the lower left, repetitive manual tasks got sort of taken care of by the industrial revolution. When we built cars, when we built steam engines, when we built a spinning jenny, and so on, instead of human beings having to drag things or even animals having to till the land and so on, the Industrial Revolution sort of solved that those class of problems, repetitive manual things, right? But if you look at repetitive cognitive things, that is, it needs talent, it needs human intelligence, but it's repetitive, you know, switches for telephony or even money machines like what ATM, you know, we have, uh, people used to dish out cash in the cashier counters and so on. They are repetitive, but it requires a human brain. It's not like, you know, just keep doing it. You can't put an animal to it, or you can't put a young kid and, you know, and so on, right? Which, was, which used to happen prior to the Industrial Revolution. Those kind of tasks, largely the computer revolution took care of, okay? Even smart things, it could do, but they were repetitive, so repetitive tasks could be done. When you look at the lower right, manual and non-repetitive, okay? So these are like building cars. It's not the exact same thing you're doing. You're different, doing different, different things. You're working on the engine, you're working on the carburetor, you're working on the seats and so on and so on. And not repetitive, but a lot of it is manual, okay? This is not just computers running programs, but actually building a car, okay? Or robotic automation, Amazon warehouses, where things are moving around. They are non-repetitive, also manual. This also got taken care of by sort of robots and automation. 
Whereas the place where JNAI plays is non-repetitive, cognitive. This is where we thought, human beings, only we can do it. Even now, doctors, lawyers, they all get very upset. JNAI is going to do certain things. No, 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 it's not really human. It doesn't have the human touch and so on. Okay, maybe it doesn't, but maybe it can do a whole bunch of things, right? So, cognitive, non-repetitive tasks are what Gen AI is looking at. What we thought only human beings could do, now Gen AI will be able to do. Next slide. So, if you look at what kind of things have happened with respect to Gen AI, the input is usually text. Okay, it could be a voice, but voice also gets converted to text. Okay, so you can think of the input as text. When you go to chat GPT, you say, hey, can you, I need to give a talk today at the you know, entrepreneur conference. Can you come up with some ideas about AI in FinTech? That's text input I'm giving to chat GPT. And it's giving me a output in text, the blue box on the left, right? So, and it writes out, oh, you should talk about AI for fraud detection, you should talk about customer service, blah, 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 right? So it can give an answer, that's question answering. It can do translation, I ask it in French, it converts it to English or the vice versa. It can do summarization, hey, read this whole paper and tell me in five points for a five-year-old kind of understanding what this sophisticated paper says, summarizing. Or grammar correction, you've written a big article, you want to make sure no typos, no grammatical mistakes. Things like, you know, Chat GPT, Gemini, Bard, Claude, they all do these things. Text output. The second one is image output. It could be a mid-journey kind of image output. All these days, a lot of folks are generating images, beautiful images. And for video generation, many of you might have seen the Sora videos from OpenAI. Amazing. Mind-blowing. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the underlying amazing thing is Sora or the model needs to have figured out physics in order to simulate a lot of the things it's doing. So it's figuring out a lot of how the universe works in order to make these videos real. So there's an underlying amazing capability that these models are learning as they are generating things like videos. Of course, there's text to speech, 11 labs, amazing. You, you want it to be your uh, video to be rendered flawlessly with a nice, uh, deep accent from the West or whatever, it does all that, okay? You can suddenly say, no, I want a woman, Indian accent uh, for my, uh, your content, and it does that. Eleven Labs does uh, text and speech. There are many other companies. I'm just, by the way, I'm just throwing the names, brands here, just so that we are grounded in reality, okay? I'm not trying to sell any of them. I'm not related to any of these companies. Some of them, when I use, the use cases, I am working with some of those companies, but it's more so that you guys can go and check it out and see really what is the use case. Not so much to plug those companies or sell anything. Okay, you don't have to buy anything. Uh, but I didn't want it to be conceptual. Then it's sort of boring. Okay, everybody's talking about the hype of Gen AI. Let's talk about use cases. That real companies, what have they done and are they useful to you? Okay, and let's move on. Next slide. So there is a vast landscape of applications in different spaces that Gen AI can provide. In the tech space, I'm sure a lot of you guys have used it for marketing. Generate a piece of LinkedIn text so that you want to send it out. Of course, it comes up with bombastic language. You tone it down at times and say, hey, let's, let's be a little bit direct and so on. We've all done that prompt engineering. But a lot of people are using it on the left side, text marketing content, sales content. Hey, can you write a cool email for me about this product because I want to sell this and it is targeted to this kind of a customer. I want the voice to be salesy. I want call to action, make all this happen. And it does, right? So support, we'll come to support. General writing, okay? Your kid says, I have you know, something to submit. Can you, you know, help me with this? Well, Actually, they don't even come to you these days. They just generate it using chat GPT themselves. Uh, and, and you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a quandary. A lot of teachers are wondering, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Okay, are they learning better or are they just spitting out all this because the computer gave them? Okay. Nobody knows yet, okay? The, the, the jury is divided on all this. Uh, Note taking and so on and so forth. This is where a lot of us are using chat GPT today. I use it quite a bit. 
lot of times just for ideas. I don't like the way it constructs things. I, I write a little differently. But the ideas it gives are useful. Sometimes it can construct complex sentences much. It will take me much longer to do that wordsmithing. It does. So in many ways, it helps on the left side. Second, code generation. I can bet anybody here using it for code generation. Wonderful. Three, four. Amazing. Because, you know, I, I, I run a project called 10 bed ICU. We create ICUs in government hospitals. And our team, we have one of the largest open source communities that's building software. We have built an EMR out of 400 volunteers. We are using um, GitHub Copilot. 3x improvement in coding speed. 5x improvement in testability. Almost 8 to 10x improvement in documentation. Okay? Engineers hate to document. Okay? They hate to write English. They all want to write Java or whatever, Python or whatever, right? Okay? But GPT takes care of all that. Okay? You put bullet points. That's what we are good at, right? Hard to write paragraphs, but we can write bullet points. Okay? That's what techies are all good at. G let GPT write the paragraphs in nice, eloquent language. So, coding, code generation is going to be super important. What you can create, how, like uh, the NVIDIA CEO the other day said, for years from Barack Obama to everybody used to say, oh, everybody has to program. Everybody has to learn to program. Whether you're a techie, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a doctor, you have to learn to program because it's like math. Okay, that's what the conventional wisdom was 10 years ago. Now this NVIDIA CEO is saying, you don't have to learn to code. You just say it in English and it will code. Okay, it is coming. I think this is happening. By the way, Claude 3 is also very good at coding. Okay, so whether generating SQL, because the, the, the user is asking a complex query on transactional data and you are creating SQL on the fly, or of course, understanding your context in your environment and generating code that you want, right? I mean, it's quite amazing if you try it out. Even your comment, it completes. You're trying to say, I want you to write a code for, and then it completes your, question, your comment itself. It's sort of guessing what you need because it sees the context, right? And many times it's right. And you're going, how did it even know? How did it read my mind, right? So that's quite amazing what it can do out there, okay? Image, image generation, this is, you know, you see all the Mahabharata characters and everything coming out of mid-journey these days and, you know, uh, voice synthesis, of course, uh, video editing, so on and so forth, right? And there are many, many, many other applications in general. But now let's get to FinTech. Let's get to BFSI, just because that's what I was supposed to talk about. Next slide, please. So, well, you know what, I just you threw in the slide We'll, we'll talk about this later if necessary. There's a very powerful paradigm called retrieval augmented generation. And the reason for, the, the, the need for this is, if you use GPT or Gemini or Claude or whatever, which has read up all the content of Wikipedia and the internet and Reddit and so on and so forth, it might spit out things that are not relevant to you. It might be wrong, patently wrong, it might hallucinate, it might make up stuff, and so on. This has been one of the biggest issues with the LLMs, that it makes up stuff at times, but it's so confident the way it says it, that you believe it's right, right? And people have gone and argued cases in court thinking that this has been highlighting some uh, judgments in the past, which G GPT just made up, okay? And you go there and they look it up and they're like, no such case. GPT just made up all these uh, judgments, right? So we've heard about all that. How do you get rid of it? RAG is a very powerful technique to do that. Okay, where you give it your own data, you vectorize that data into a uh, you know, vector database, and then when you ask questions, you are trying to just get segments of the data that you've given it, okay? And then the LLM is only used to generate a nice, elegant answer based on the pieces that you have created using your documents, okay? And you're telling the LLM, don't go out of syllabus. Don't go and say, I read up the Wikipedia, I read up the internet and all that. I am giving you a book, only answer from that book, that's all, okay? That's the RAG methodology, okay? In case we need to, we'll come back to it. Next slide, please. Of course, there's fine tuning, which is slightly different. You take the LLM itself, which is a bunch of weights, you know, when they say Lama has 70 billion parameters, which means 
those many weights have been codified after the training, after the pre-trained model is all done training. And that base LLM, if you want to make it a little bit smarter, more specific on, let's say, financial terms, terminology, banking terminology, okay, then you give your own documents and you fine tune the LLM where here it's slightly different. It changes the weights itself. The weights of the, uh, between the neurons, which consist the intelligence of all that learning, is itself being modified ever so slightly to accommodate for the new data that you've given the LLM. Okay? That's pre uh, fine tuning. And this is also a method to get rid of hallucination. Although RAG has had a lot more, lot, lot more people have used RAG, okay, retrieval augmented generation. Okay, the Lama Index is a good this thing, and Langchain and other people have good frameworks for RAG. Next slide. So let's go through a few use cases of uh, in the banking space. Next slide. The first, uh, okay, well, we're going to talk about maybe three or four of these. I don't know how much time we'll have. Financial decision making through analytics is one use case. Language understanding and translation. I'm going to try and talk only in the banking space or the fintech space. Customer service, okay. Regulatory compliance, huge, especially in banks. RBI, type of central banks have a uh, lot of regulatory inputs on how to run. And of course, personalized banking. Next slide. So, ooh, no, I don't want this. Next slide. Yes, I just saw this Claude 3 video that uh, Anthropic put out three days ago. And they just took this image from Wikipedia. They went to the Wikipedia page that says GDP of the United States. It gave that graph. So they asked Claude 3, Claude 3, can you pick up and plot the GDP of the US based on that image? Okay, so this is multimodal. It's using advanced vision capabilities of plot 3, it picked up that graph, it figured out, oh, exactly year by year, wh what is the GDP of the United States? Okay, it wrote a little program, okay, and you can see the program, if you see, watch this video, you can see the uh, program that it wrote, okay, and it actually created this graph. Next slide. And then this guy asked it, hey, can you predict the US GDP in the future? Five more minutes? Oh, okay. I get to wait for one hour, but I get five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it, so it does Monte Carlo simulations of what the GDP of the US would be in the future by writing a program, right? Next slide. That's code generation capabilities. Then this guy asks, can you show me the world GDP prediction 2020 to 2030? Of course, we might disagree where India is and all that, but it has actually created multiple agents and run across run code for each country and put this pie chart together. And you can see this happening, it's quite amazing. Right, okay, next slide. So this is one example. The next example, okay, is language understanding and translation. I always wonder, hey, can we do banking in this country by just talking to it? Tomorrow I'm gonna to be driving to Mysore. I'm always on my car place setting, you know, setting up calendar appointments and so on. Can I just say, hey, but, you know, if HDFC bank or something wakes me up on CarPlay and says, hey, you have to pay your whatever mortgage. Can I pay it now? I just say, go ahead. Wonderful. Okay. Imagine if you're a farmer, uh, you're in a little village and a woman wants to buy a buffalo. Can she speak in Canada and say, you know, can you give me a loan for a buffalo? Okay. I'm not even literate. Can I just talk to the bank? Okay. I know how to talk. I understand numbers. I know a little bit of math. I am running a little business. Why can't I do banking? Right? Conversational. Can we break everything down to conversational where even literacy is not our issue? Anybody can do banking, right? Only people like us know how to do banking. They're all in English forms. Can we break that down? So for product discovery, for customer support, customer acquisition, sales, we can do this, all of that. Next slide. Okay, I don't have the time. I was actually going to show you as a demo of how this actually works. A question and answer session are live, but we'll go to the next slide. If you want to, you can go ahead. Maybe that the demos are there on trust. Next slide. Next slide. Customer service. This company called Klarna. I don't know how much of this is accurate, but about a couple of weeks ago, this article came out. Maybe ten days ago, 
that the AI assistance provided by Klarna had 2.3 million conversations, two thirds customer service chats, and they did the work of 700 full-time agents, okay? Apparently, it's on par with human agents with regard to customer satisfaction scores. You can read all that stuff. What I'm trying to say is, customer service is a fantastic killer app when it comes to generative AI. No human is going to go through all your CTR records, understand the real needs of the customer, and then answer the question. Okay? Whereas AI can, Gen AI can, and give eloquent answers in your own language. Right? Very interesting use case. Next slide. Regulatory compliance. This company, Clarity Law, takes revenue recognition in the United States and automates it using Gen AI. That means you have complex, go to the next slide. You have complex issues with respect to, you know, revenue recognition terms in the US. There are certain laws, how you recognize revenue. It can check all your master service agreements, purchase orders, invoices, and actually figure out how much revenue you can rec recognize, right? So lots of gaps in the data. It can pick up, analyze all this, and do this. And they're doing an amazing job at this. Next slide. So they, they use it be, between all, uh, you know, purchase orders and MSAs and all of this. They've completely automated revenue recognition and a bunch of other financial uh, sort of tasks, uh, processes that need to be automated. Okay, next slide. That's it, thank you so much. out of time but it was absolutely interesting thank you so much Rikant requesting Ritu yes you have If you're flying on a plane, where did you fly from? Then? From Delhi. 90% of the flying of the plane was the computer. Okay? And if the pilot actually did the flying, I'd be very nervous to sit on a plane. It is just too many parameters. No human can handle that, those many parameters at any given time. Lot, lot more people will be dying. So in the same way, when you look at healthcare, okay, there are so many parameters. Can AI look at my MRI? Can AI look at the 5,000 new peer-reviewed articles that have come out and specify exactly what I need to do? All of these, I think, will improve the quality of care, service. So doctors are going to, instead of doing grunge work, you know, instead of doing boring, repetitive tasks, they will probably deliver care at a much higher level using these systems. So I don't see it as, oh, because AI is able to do amazing things that once humans did, Oh, we are all out of a job and AI is going to rule the world or whatever. We're going to do more interesting, more useful stuff, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, 